Hi, I'm Kim Izzarelli, and welcome to Insights with Kim Izzarelli. Today, Jeff Smith is a partner, senior partner with a law firm in New York City. But in 1969, a drug raid in Stony Brook University left him a prisoner serving seven to 15 years at the Green Haven Correctional Facility for Marijuana Offenses. In 1972, Governor Nelson Rockefeller commuted Jeff's sentence and made him um, eligible for a parole release in January of 1973, serving only after three and a half years. Through a program that has since become known as the Osborne Association, he became the first inmate in New York State to earn a college degree at Dutchess Community College. And today he is the chair of the board of the Osborne Association, and we'll find out a lot more about that today. Um, upon his release from jail, he continued his undergraduate education at Vassar. He earned a master's degree at the Woodrow, Woodrow Wilson uh, Public and International Affairs School and at Princeton, University, uh, at Princeton University and a degree in law from Yale. Um, I want to find out more about your story, Jeff, uh, but I, I'm going to also turn to our second guest, Carolina Cordero Dyer. Um, Carolina is the Associate Executive director, director for the Osborne Association. She oversees the agency's financial and grants management units, uh, facilities and real estate, as well as its business initiatives. Under her leadership, um, Ms. Osborne, uh, Ms. Dyer has um, uh, created the Career Center. Um, as well as offering many um, employment opportunities and career ladders for people with criminal re uh, records. Um, Ms. Dyer has a degree in business from Texas A&M. She also has a master's uh, degree in administration from the Stern School at NYU, and she's also a CPA. So thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. Uh, Jeff, go back to the early years, back in 1969. What were you thinking when you were sitting in prison <laughs> You're a young man, you know, just the beginning of your life, and how did you feel at that point in time? Cheated. Mm. <laughs> Frankly, I felt uh, that it was the entire thing was unfair. I had been actually out in the Haight-Ashbury when I called a friend and found out the police had come to my house looking for me, and uh, foolishly, as it turned out, got on a plane and flew home to turn myself in. I don't know if you remember the old TV show, The Fugitive, but I wasn't going to become uh, the fugitive over a couple of ounces of marijuana. Uh, that turned out to be, uh, as I said, probably a mistake. I ended up, uh, after about a year and a half of pretrial back and forth, I ended up getting sentenced to 7 to 15 years, uh, which at age 21 seems pretty much like the rest of your life. Um, and uh, off I went. I served some time in Sing Sing, right here in beautiful Westchester County, okay. and uh, then the rest of the time in Green Haven. I decided I wasn't going to let it go to waste, so uh, there was a program called the South 40 Corporation that had been founded by uh, Bill and Helen Vanderbilt, a, a young corporation by Osborne standards, um, and uh, they ran uh, a program that was based on what they called imaginal education, on the theory that people are in jail often because their image of themselves doesn't match the world's image of them, what the world sees, and so they make bad decisions. And uh, the the program um, they they taught a speech course, you know, Dale Carnegie mm -hmm. speech course. Um, I. Um, thought that was a great idea because they were going to give us college credit for it, and I wrote them a letter excoriating these rich people for uh, not getting us college degrees. So I converted it into a college degree program, and I became the first person in the state to, uh, to get a college degree, a two-year college degree from Dutchess Community College. Um, and I left prison on a Friday, largely on the strength of that. I got my sentence commuted. Um, and I took up residence in a co-ed dormitory at Vassar College on a Sunday. It was quite a change. Hmm. Hmm. Wow. Well, Ms. Dyer, tell That's us. It's not a very common story for people <laughs> leaving <laughs> it, prison, it isn't? I have to say, though. <laughs> so, so today you're the chair of this association. Correct. 
and you serve um, approximately 8,000 individuals, I believe, we th do. through New York State? We, we serve in New York State about 8,000 individuals and their families. We're in 21 uh, state correctional facilities, as well as Rikers Island, doing a wide variety of things. We really focus on the things that we know will make a difference in supporting people uh, in terms of connect, reconnecting with their families, uh, staying clean of drugs, getting jobs when they're out, really what will support them uh, from in terms of preventing crime and reducing the risk of reincarceration. Mm -hmm. You know, we work with people on the outside as well as on the inside. Um, and on the inside, we have uh, been running for, I guess since the mid-80s, parenting programs. We were the, one of the first organizations in the country to offer parenting to men. Um, we've, we've always believed that um, both parents are important uh, and, and the father is, is, is so important to a child's life. And even, in, even uh, incarcerated, a father can make a difference and learn, to, mm -hmm. and learn to be a good parent and make a difference in the child's life. How many children in New York have parents in prison? Uh, the number is over 100,000 uh, with a parent in prison. Uh, you're looking at, in the U United States, one in 23 uh, has a parent in prison. It used to be one in 125, 25 years ago. So the impact of incarceration on children, I think, is something that um, a lot of people, and I probably wouldn't even know if I weren't in, you know, working in the field, a lot of people aren't aware of the impact on, on children. And, and, you know, um, human rights advocates call parental incarceration one of the biggest threats to child well-being in the United States. So a, a, a prisoner, a person coming out of incar incarceration, having a family to go to after is a big part of their success getting it, back into it is, mainstream uh, life. Yes, reconnecting with your family uh, is one of the key factors in somebody's successful reentry. Uh, as is, you know, drug treatment, staying clean of drugs, right. getting a job, stabilizing your housing. Those are all the things that we know make a difference. And Osborne Association has been doing those things for, um, actually, Very long. <laughs> a long, a long time. Well, let's talk. One hundred years ago. Let's yeah, do I was going to ask. A minute on the background <laughs> of Osborne. A hundred years ago today, uh, this year rather. Uh, Thomas Mott Osborne, mm -hmm. who was a wealthy upstate industrialist, uh, made uh, a family fortune that still hangs around um, on farm implements, um, got involved in local politics, was the mayor of Auburn, New York, which was the, is, the, is the oldest operating prison in the United States still, is the uh, New York State prison at Auburn. Um, and I guess he was friends with a governor at the turn of the last century and was asked to work on a, uh, a commission to make proposals on prisons. Um, and he got himself locked into Auburn prison under a, a phony name for a week. Tom Brown, I think was mm -hmm. the name. Got himself locked in for a week and came out and sort of famously said, uh, the prisons are human scrap heaps and we need to turn them into, uh, into factories to turn people around and, and rebuild them. And uh, he became the leader of the prison reform rehabilitation movement in this country at a, in just before World War I. Um, he formed the Mutual Welfare League. He was briefly the, the warden of Sing Sing. And uh, he formed the Mutual Welfare League, sort of uh, a, a semi-alumni club, a semi 12-step program for ex-offenders and inside. And that became the Osborne Association 80 years ago after Thomas Mott Osborne passed away. Um, it was incorporated as the Osborne Association and we've been running programs since then. Uh, 100 years. Wow. So your program or your sites are in the Bronx, in Brooklyn, and you also have one here in North and Duchess in Poughkeepsie? In Poughkeepsie. Okay. Yes, and, and as I said, we're also, uh, we work inside of uh, state correctional facilities and inside Rikers Island, so you could, if you uh, include all of those, we've got nearly, you know, uh, nearly 30 sites. Okay. And tell me about some of the programs that you offer. Obviously, 
vocation skills is one area that you focus on. What are some of the other programs that you offer? Um, we do licensed uh, drug treatment mm -hmm. as an alternative to incarceration. Uh, we've been doing that for many years, um, and as uh, many as many of us know, you know, criminal justice and prisons have been a solution for what has been a public health crisis. Mm -hmm. So we've been working with, uh, in, in the Bronx, we've been working with, with um, the courts for many years and what judges have been doing is been sending folks uh, to our program as an alternative to incarceration okay. rather than, than serving a sentence. Um, so we've been doing that for many years and the folks that are, are in this, we call it ATI program, uh, have been very successful. Uh, we've got, we're looking at, you know, about 80% um, stay out of jail and prison two years after treatment, which is, in direct treatment terms, is a very, very uh, mm -hmm. successful program. Uh, so that's one of the programs that, that uh, we've run for many years. We also uh, operate in Rikers Island. We're doing reentry services. We've been doing that for many years as well, uh, working with people on the inside um, to, to plan for their release, and then on the outside, doing things like, well, we do things like uh, even their parenting education, reconnecting with your family, workforce development, jobs, mm -hmm. um, all the things, again, that we know make a difference. Um, Literacy, I, I know this is an area that Jeff's been really involved with. Um, how, you know, g getting a GED or being able to graduate from a program as he did. Tell us a little bit about how that works and what you do there. Yeah, I don't think we, we do the GED directly. Okay. The Most prisons in New York, to their credit, do operate GED programs. But as we intake people to our in-prison programs, that's sort of step one, go finish your GED. And, uh, and that becomes the first step in vocational training and in other interventions to try to turn them around, let them see what they're doing. and. Uh, we have a, a deep and abiding belief at Osborne that people have the capacity to change. And we try to honor that capacity by, by making opportunities available. We don't, uh, in, a, in a rigorous way, we don't try to tell people this is what you must do. Uh, but getting the GED is one of the things we're pretty yeah. hard about. Get your GED, get your Social okay. Security card, those kinds of things. Okay, so um, ABLE is a program that's uh, at Rikers Island that serves 16 to 18 year olds? That's one of our newest programs, very, very exciting program. Um, we are the nation's first uh, provider of, uh, or recipient of what's called a social impact bond. So we received funding from Goldman Sachs uh, to provide services on Rikers Island to every single uh, adolescent on Rikers Island, every 16 to 18 years old. Uh, and we're doing cognitive behavioral therapy. It's a social impact bond because what, how it works is that Goldman Sachs will get a rate of return depending on the success of the program. Wow. Really revolutionary way of funding philanthropy. The uh, only other one that's been done is in the UK. Uh, so this is a new program. We've been running it for less than a year. We're being independently evaluated and uh, we're very excited about the opportunity that that, that that presents for the young people on Rikers Island. And I know, you know, personally, uh, many of us at Osborne are very, it's not only the kind of fancy f uh, funding mechanism, but the idea of being able to provide therapy to every single adolescent on Rikers Island, not to leave one untouched, and to think about the impact that that has on their future mm -hmm. and on our future, right? It's, it's just quite extraordinary. What about Arches and mentoring? How does that work? Uh, Arches is working mostly this, uh, with people on probation, mm -hmm. uh, and it's in our community facility in the Bronx. So we're, uh, people are referred uh, from prob probation to our facility, and they're connected with a mentor, somebody who has um, experienced what they've experienced, and they work with them um, you know, through a series of jour journaling mm -hmm. and kind of work on that, work with them to support them in their, tra in their transition. And we talked a little bit about the um, initiative for children and their parents. Um, can you just tell us a little bit more about um, some of the, you know, uh, are parents able to re-enter more quickly, get back into life after the experience of being through this program? Uh, yeah, we do a lot of work with um, 
parents as well as their children. So it's kind of a holistic approach. We have, we work with, for example, in Albion, which is the largest women's correctional facility in central New York. We do parenting classes with the women in Albion. We work with their children in the community. And then three times a year, we actually take their children to visit their mothers um, in Albion. We're also offering something new uh, for, for the women in Albion. We're offering televisiting. We're also offering this at Rikers Island. This is a way where children have the opportunity, instead of taking a long trip to visit their parent that is incarcerated, uh, they're able to, when they're not able to do that, they, they have a televisit. So they meet, they go to our office, they um, are set up with, with, with our staff that are mm -hmm. trained to counsel them before and after the visit. They have the visit with their, with their parent. Um, and it's something we're also very excited about what that, what that represents in terms of keeping children providing to children when they're not able to make that difficult right. trip. Because as much as there's a need for the parent to stay connected to the child, it's very easy for the child if they're not even seeing the parent visually on a camera right. or in person um, to feel detached at that point too if they Absolutely. don't have that communication. We want to be sure that the, the, the televisits <laughs> don't become the visiting mode because we think the physical contact, particularly between children and their parents, the physical contact is very important as anybody who has kids knows. <laughs> um, but um, it's a good supplement because Albion is eight, hour, yeah. eight hours away from New York City or, or yeah. something like that. And, some and frankly, there are places in New York City that are an hour and a half to two hours away from Rikers Island. So it's, mm -hmm. it, it's, it's, uh, it, it's a good supplement. It's not the, it's not the answer. Mm -hmm. You know, something a, a, a mother, uh, a wife, mother of kids, and, and dad was in jail said a few years back uh, still rings with me she says when you sentence my husband t to jail you sentenced me and my kids to jail too and we're serving time along with them we're waiting for the end Jeff I just want to talk about your um, career a little bit because because um, I like to brag about you and <laughs> 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 but you really um, you've you've really had some really significant career milestones, uh, you know, uh, recovering over a billion dollars in class action suits. Uh, um, you've done a lot of work on behalf of plaintiffs, plaintiffs for wage and hour employment law and consumer protection litigation. So, I mean, do you ever think about how different your life would be um, had you not had the opportunity to go on and do these things? I, I thought about it. It's a question many people ask is, do you owe this to jail? And I don't. I, I think I, I, I did what I did with my life despite jail. But on the other hand, I have to acknowledge that it opened some doors. I'm not sure I would have gotten into uh, Yale Law School if I didn't have this weird little thing. Anybody who's got kids applying to school knows it, it isn't straight A's that get you into these schools anymore. It's having some weird little thing that opens the mm. door. So it, there may be, you know, there may be an element of that. I acknowledge that. But as I said, it's not a common story. Um, people, although I do know, I know another ex-con from from uh, Rhode Island who went through Yale, consulted me on how to get in, went through Yale, and now works as a lawyer at a, at a very prominent firm down in Florida. Um, so it does happen, but um, it happens despite. And it couldn't have happened even to me without, uh, without the kind of help I had when I got out. Um, I went directly to school, which is not a bad transition. You know, somebody mm -hmm. still mm -hmm. provides your housing, your schedule, and mm -hmm. your food. Uh, so that was actually pretty easy. Those are stumbling blocks, as Carolina has said. Those are stumbling blocks for a lot of people. Where do I get the money to get my next meal? Uh, there's a huge percentage of recidivists are unemployed. 60, 70 percent mm -hmm. of people who recidivate are unemployed. Um, employment is crucial. We, uh, one of the things that uh, we have been, I am very proud about that we've done is, is this workforce development where we, we do, uh, we have a cadre of employers who are willing to take what at first seems like a big risk and hire an ex-con. Um, Carolina can talk more about how we try to match people to these jobs, but uh, these employers come back and they come back and they come back because they're finding people that have uh, more reason to want to do well at work than your average person. Okay. Everybody wants money, but some people know this they need the money. To, that's right. 
Yeah. That's right. So, so, it, it works so what very are some well. of the things that you say to prospective employers looking to get involved with this program about taking what they might perceive to be a risk? Um, well, one thing I did want to point out, is, as Jeff had indicated, as tough as uh, it is, this economy is, and the great uh, recession that we're in, uh, it is in the high unemployment that many of us are experiencing, it is even tougher for, for formerly incarcerated. You're looking at unemployment rates of over 60 percent. So we, we work, we've been working with people for a while in terms of workforce development. One of, we, we, we do job readiness training, and that is, goes beyond you know, kind of resume, resume preparation or how to interview, is to really have people deal with the choices that they made that had them where they ended up, right? So um, they can see that there's another choice to make, mm -hmm. and they can kind of take, take charge of their lives, right, and know that they can make a difference in their lives. And that really is, is everything That's we huge. do. It might be the first at. time that was ever yeah. presented <laughs> to them that way yeah. that there is a choice. There's a it, choice. You make that choice. Yeah. So. And the other thing is that the, your future is not dictated by what you did in the past, mm -hmm. right? Uh, which is very liberating for all of us if we think about that, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. <laughs> I know on a personal level it's very right. liberating. Um, so what we do is we do job readiness training. We also um, have programs where we have give people an opportunity to, to obtain certif certifications. Uh, we've done, a, we have a construction skills lab. Uh, so we really t are working with people to not only just get them a job, but to get them a career, right? Because we know that an entry level minimum wage job is not going to sustain an individual, much less somebody with a family. Um, so that being said, um, how do we approach employers? One thing I think that's important to note is um, New York State has been, especially under uh, Governor Cuomo has taken a lot of initiative to address this because the state recognizes that if people coming out of prison don't get jobs, they're going to, they, like, chances are they'll come back. Mm -hmm. So the governor has something called a Work for Success program, and he is promoting uh, employment for formerly incarcerated. And they're, in fact, in New York State, it is against the law to discriminate uh, solely based on somebody's criminal record which I think is news to a lot of people. Um, and that's one of the reasons that, one of the things that we wanted to talk about. So really to educate employers that um, what's important, yes, you can look at somebody's criminal uh, history, but you have to take it into context. Mm -hmm. So what was the offense? Is there any relationship between the offense and the job? How long ago was the person incarcerated? Right. How much time did they serve? So you, you look at all of these things so that you can really look at the person as a whole. Then you make a decision, um, you know, in some cases it may not be appropriate to hire the person. In other cases, you can. It That's won't make a difference. Okay. Um, so what do we tell employers, getting back to your original question? Mm -hmm. um, one is if you look at these factors, in many cases there's no relationship between the criminal record and the performance on the job. Right. And, and uh, we know that people out, you know, let's say people who are out of prison for seven years or more are no more likely to reoffend than, than uh, any, anyone that's else. That's interesting. So, yeah, there's a lot of, there's a lot of myths around that. Yeah. So that's one. Two, if you hire somebody um, who has come through a program like Osborne's, you've got Osborne behind them, right? We've prepared them, we've gotten them job ready, and we're there to support the employer. Um, you know, it, for any needs they may have. So we can even be kind of like an HR arm to the employer. Um, the third thing I think is, um, which is the most important to me, e you know, as an employer as well, it's, an, it's important that employers have choices. So you want to, if you're an employer, you want to have a choice about who you hire. You want to be able to look at everyone and make a decision about who is the best for that job. Mm -hmm. And if you blanketly eliminate people with criminal records, you're eliminating your own choices. So those, those are some of the things that we, we would tell employers. Uh, we have a few minutes left. I just want to give you both a chance to reflect on um, something I read in your brochure, that um, by age 23, a third of all Americans have been arrested. That's a shocking statistic. Uh, it, is there any 
the, 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 there's uh, some discussion in Albany right now on uh, modifying our drug laws. Do you have any opinion on this, Jeff? And I'm sure you do. <laughs> Why I, we have so have many people being opinion. arrested? Um, I I think we ought to decriminalize de de uh, drugs, and I, all across the board drugs. I think we, it's a public health problem. It's a serious public health problem. Um, and we need to put the resources into public health measures to try to control it. I think that will alleviate a lot of the problems in prisons. If um, anybody's followed the California story where the prisons are under court orders now to just put people out because they're too overcrowded and it's inhumane, um, there's, there's, that's a serious problem. Um, I think that uh, we need to realize, really understand that imprisonment is an extremely expensive way to deal with social problems. Right now we, we lock up people who are mentally disturbed because we have no other place to put them. We lock up people who have drug problems because we really have no other place to put them. We lock up people who have honesty problems uh, when locking them up isn't going to solve anything because they're going to come out and they're going to have even more dishonesty problems. Uh, violence is, is a whole other category and it, it scares a lot of people, um, but there are better ways even to deal with violent offenders than incarceration. Uh, we show, it with our programs and other programs like ours, show that you can, the whole social impact bond that Carolina was talking about before, um, the idea is that it's funded initially in the risky stage to see if it'll work. It's funded privately. Um, and if it works, the government, well, not Osborne, the government will pay Goldman. Very the city important. of New yeah. York will pay yeah. Goldman. And the benchmarks that we have to meet for Goldman to earn that money show the city that we've saved them way more than the $12 million that they'll have to pay Goldman. Um, and then the city adopts the program and funds the program thereafter. People need to realize that there are w way more economically efficient ways to deal with the problem. And the beauty of it is that these ways that are more economically efficient deal with the problem better. People are much less likely to reoffend if they've if they've been dealt with in a probation setting than, than in an incarceration setting. Uh, or in some other kind of a supervised setting. Um, and that's what we need to realize, that's what we need to do in this country to help the co hold the cost down. And it's embarrassing. We have 5% of the world's population and 25% of the world's prison population. What does that say about democracy and freedom in the United States? We incarcerate more people as a percentage, at least, and maybe in absolute numbers, than China does. There's hope on the horizon. Um, New York State has led the country in reductions in both crime and incarceration, which we've been trying to say that for a long time. You don't have to have one, you don't have to have incarceration to reduce crime. And New York State in the last 10 years has led has led the nation. Very good. Well, I, that's all we have time for today. We could talk much longer. But I want to thank my guest, Carolina, Carolina Codero Dyer, the Associate Executive Director of the Osborne Association, and Jeff Smith, the Chair of the Osborne Association. Thank you for being here today. We'll see you next week.